on every page is a there's a thousand decisions that have to be made and, and it's a torment and it's really hard to do and you don't know why you're doing it it's so painful but somehow you've got to write in such a way that that pain sort of disappears <laughs> got into writing was by writing diaries from when I was very young and I kept on going and kept on going. By the time I was in my mid-30s I was able to use those diaries as the basis of my first novel which is called Monkey Grip. I took the diaries volume by volume or crappy exercise book by crappy exercise book down to the, the State Library which was the only quiet place I knew to work while my daughter was in kindergarten. I took the parts of the diaries that seemed to me to be interesting and I left out all the boring bits. There was a story that was coming out of the sort of generalised mess of daily life. And I followed that story and lived it through to the end. That was a very lucky time because we had a Labor government. They had a very generous policy. If you were a single mother, you could get a, what was called a single mother's benefit and you could live on that. Well, that, that's where you needed to live in a, in a group house because it, it wasn't enough money to sort of live grandly, obviously. The social conditions of the time, I think, made those big sprawling households a possibility and the freedom that we had. You can't get a cheap house. You can't, you can't find a house to rent. We moved from house to house, um, suburb to suburb, to keep, to keep our, our group houses going. I think there was a kind of looseness in society that enabled the kind of lives that, that we lived. And now things are much more sort of hard-edged and desperate. So I, I, it's not possible for me to imagine that that sort of sprawling life being lived now. People are much more anxious. We felt freer and we were freer. The characters all live in a, um, a big sort of communal house in, in a suburb of Melbourne, it's, it's set in the 70s. There were single mothers, several single mothers, I was one, in the house, and their children, and then other people who were, either were or weren't in, involved with the mothers in question. Uh, the other adults in the house helped us to raise the children, and that, that was uh, a time I look back on with great happiness and pleasure, regret almost, that it doesn't still exist. So plainly it's clearly based on my own experience. All the, almost all the people in it are based on real people. So I changed everybody's names and took it to a publisher. The book, to my amazement, immediately was taken up and became quite successful and sold a lot of copies. Uh, as one person pointed out years later, there's a lot of lax parenting in the book. And one of the main characters is a heroin addict and uh, his heroin addiction comes and goes throughout the story. This was considered to be, um, by some people, not the material for uh, literature. But I sort of feel that I love them. And even the one that is based upon me, which is Nora, I mean, I, I, if I wanted to look at her behaviour now, you see, I've already used that rather disapproving word, behaviour, um, I could say, what a fool, what did she think she was doing? It could only end in disaster and, and so on and so forth. But it is, it is what it was and I'm happy to let it be that. The Children's Bark is a much more sort of technically sophisticated book. I, I, I sort of can't believe that I actually wrote it. It's the only one of my books that I have that strange feeling about. When I pick it up, I think, gosh, this is actually really good. I mean, it's technically good. And how on earth did I do that? See, I'd love to be able to say, and when I was writing The Children's Bark, I thought this, I thought that, but I don't remember. I don't remember how I wrote it. And it looks like the sort of book that might, it might have, it's quite a short book, and it looks like the sort of book that might have just come, you know, pouring out. But in my experience, books don't come pouring out. They just don't. And every page is a there's a thousand decisions that have to be made and, and it's a torment and it's really hard to do and you don't know why you're doing it, it's so painful. But somehow you've got to write in such a way that that pain sort of disappears <laughs> so the reader doesn't have to suffer that pain as well as the pain of the characters. 
Well, the children's bark, the title is a is the title of a kid's music book of early you know pieces of bark that you might learn to play on the piano when you're a child. When I was about forty, which is around about the time I wrote that book, I I decided that I'd never learnt a musical instrument, and I loved music, and it meant an enormous amount to me, but listening, but I'd never learned to play, and so I thought, oh, I'm going to take piano lessons. So I go to this piano teacher in the neighbourhood and I told him that I wanted to learn to play Bach. And he wasn't interested in Bach, he was interested in Bartok, who is of course a much, you know, a very spiky kind of modern composer. So I started to toiling my way through these, this piece called Microcosmos, which is his, you know, kids level thing. And it was so difficult and I really could not, I had no talent, I feel, and uh, but it didn't matter. I loved loved wrestling with them, and, I, and and he taught me a couple little pieces of Bach, and they seemed particularly the Bach. I love Bach because because there's under everything he wrote, in running through everything he wrote, there's this enormous and tremendous and profound sense of order, and. It's not all about romantic bursts of passion and it's about the beauty and regularity of order and its depth. There's much, many fewer characters, it's much more tightly focused. Um, it is still about people, you know, it's a household and people coming and going and changing the dynamic of the household in ways that might, might or might not be destructive. Love and sex and what they are or might be and their their regenerative power and, and their destructive power, both of them. Faithfulness, I think, is something that comes up in the children's bark in ways it probably didn't in Monkey Grip. It, it's about a marriage and a family that's under certain very difficult pressures. It's a, it's a family that's got a child who is, uh, what's wrong with that child is, is never named in the book, but I think of it as being a form of autism when I wrote that book, I don't think the word was even in, in... Like a lot of autistic children, he had a terrific ear for music and could sing and he could remember tunes and he sang. He could hardly speak. He was only about, I guess, three or four, but he sang in this high, pure, sweet voice. And when the character pushes him on the swing, he wants to be sung to all the time. Singing and music are very calming to him and discordant sounds are torture to him. When he hears an ambulance siren, he, he screams and claws at himself because it causes him anguish. And, and Athena, the wife in the, of the couple, she's trying to learn the piano, not well, but she's struggling with it. And then in, into their marriage come a couple of louche, um, kind of rock and roll type of people uh, and and everything for a moment is blown sky high and the question is can they re-establish trust and can their family continue after this disruption? Not sure what you would call a happy ending but it resolves. I mean it's it's got a shape this book. It's a shapely book unlike Monkey Grip which is like all over the shop. And that's part of its charm. But but the children's bark is, um, I managed to kind of draw all the strands together at the end. And there's a scene at the end, which you could see as perhaps a happy ending. And it gave me great pleasure to write it. Uh, and an, an older woman writer who I greatly admired in Australia uh, said to me that the, the children's bark was a conservative novel. She said, and I've noticed, she said, that women, when they've got teenage daughters, tend to write conservative books. I was very struck by that. Um, I think it's partly, you can see why one would. I mean, you don't want to write a book that says, listen, sweetheart, don't get married, it's a disaster, it's all going to end in pain. Well, you don't want to say that to your kids. See, I'm terribly interested in children. I've only got one child. I've got a couple of grandchildren now and they're the happiest things that ever happened to me in my life. And I'm very interested in children as characters. I love their 
their struggles to articulate what they know and their sharp eyes and their understanding of things that we think will be beyond them. The, the guy who directed a film that was based on monkey grip said to me once, it was really hard to write the screenplay. He said, because it's like, it, it's more like a TV series than, um, you know, because it, the, 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 the themes go wandering on and they go this way and that. But we, with the children's bark, they're under control. I'm in control. Now, if I compare those two books, I'm completely staggered by the difference in the way, in the ways they're written. I know, it, it seems that in the intervening years I learnt to write. The way I got interested in it was I was reading the newspaper. And, or no, it was on TV. I saw that this guy had, uh, that there'd been a accident and a guy had driven his car into a very, very deep hole that was left over. Uh, after they dug out the dirt to, to build an overpass on, on a nearby road. And he was driving, he was a divorced father, he was driving his three little boys home after an access visit on Father's Day. And when they came down the hill towards this dam, the car veered off the road across the oncoming traffic and went across some bumpy ground and headfirst into this dam and it just went straight to the bottom. And the man got out of the car uh, and swam to the bank and the car had disappeared in the, in the dark water. It was, it was night. And he hitched a ride back to the town, to the town where they lived, a small town. Two guys picked him up on the road and he was dripping wet and covered in slime. They said, what's the matter? He said, oh, I've just put my car in the dam and, and, and my kids are in it and take me to my wife. And they say, well, what, what, we'll try to, let's, we'll dive down, we'll try and see if we can get them out. He said, no, no, it's too late now, drive me back to my wife. So that's what they did. And as one of them said, when he was giving evidence, he said, I'd done the stupidest thing in my life and I did. And um, those poor guys are sort of devastated. Not, I don't think there was any chance they could have saved the children, but it's a cause of great grief and suffering to them that they that they allowed him to. So anyway, that's the basic that's the basis of the, the story, and I saw it on the news and it was horrible. You, you didn't know any of those details. All I saw was a car had gone into a dark water, and the police, you know, on the on the news you could see the um, ambulance and the the rescue lights just on top of this dark pond and I just sort of said a prayer. I said, oh Lord, let this be an accident. That's how I got interested. And so then after a while, after some months, they charged the guy. He was charged with having killed the kids. There were seven hearings over seven years. He got as far as the High Court or tried to go as far as the High Court, but they wouldn't hear it. And so now he's in jail and he's, he got, I don't know, 33 years, I think. And, and this is what always, what always draws me to a criminal case, is I just want to have a look at the person who's accused of the crime. I just, I just have great curiosity to think what such a person might look like and be like. Often you go into a court, or this used to be the case before I'd done a lot of it, you go to the court expecting to see a horrible, beastly person, you know, a sort of murderous, dark, creature in the dock, but what you mostly see is a devastated, broken person, somebody who's done something so terrible or is have, accused of having done something so terrible that, that it's destroyed their life. When the book came out, some people said, I'm not going to read this book because nowhere in this book does she say that Robert Farquharson is a monster. And firstly, I thought, well, how would you know if you haven't read the book? And secondly, if he had been a monster, I wouldn't have been interested in writing about him because then he would have been a psychopath. And, and there's not much, I think this is true, there's not much that the ordinary person can learn from what psychopaths are and do. 
that's not what I'm interested in anyway. I'm interested in people who, an ordinary person, someone who might be like me, somebody whose a marriage is broken, they've got a broken heart, they've been separated from their children and are full of pain and rage and they don't know what to do with it. I'm interested in that kind of person and, and how they deal with their anguish. A previous book I wrote, which was called Joe Chinque's Consolation, was a story of um, a young man who'd been um, killed by his girlfriend. Uh, and that was another very interesting and strange case. That was a few years earlier, about 10 years earlier, actually. And um, so that, and that was in a different city, and I followed that. And, um, you know, I was interested in that for the same reason, wanting to see the person, have a look, you know, just be in the same room. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time in court, and I learnt a lot. It's, a, it's always surprising to me, although it shouldn't be because I used to be like this myself, it, but it does surprise me when people say, you know, even educated people say to me, how did you get permission to go to that trial? And I used to think that. I used to think sitting in a courtroom, I'd think right at the beginning, I'd think in a minute someone's going to come up and throw me out. you know, say, who are you? What are you doing here? Get out. But then, of course, I realised that it, it, uh, this is a democracy and <laughs> courts are open. And court, and court proceedings are being conducted in our names. So we have every right to be there and to watch and listen. But people do still think of courts as being almost, almost secret places that you need special permission to go to. And, and it was, when I realised that wasn't the case, it was wonderful. It was like a whole world just opened up to me. And I just would, I got kind of hooked on it really. In between books, I've always earned a living by doing freelance journalism. So sometimes I'd go into a court and just sit down and the trial would already be running and I wouldn't know what it was about. And that's part of the, the, the sort of thrill of it. You go in there and you don't know what it's about. It's like we're going into a movie when it's halfway through and you think, oh, am I smart enough? to figure out what this is actually about. Can I pick up all the clues that are all around me and what people are saying and who's the, who are the weeping people in the, in the public seats and who's the jury and what looks are on their faces. It's this enormous feast of profound human experience because everyone in that room uh, is in extremis. You know, they're, they're in a place where they never thought they'd be uh, even the people in the jury don't know you. You don't know what sort of a case you're going to be put in front of. I learned an enormous amount about the law from watching that. I got I got friendly with some journalists, I mean real journalists, who uh, would explain things to me. And I got to know a few lawyers and um, barristers and I learned a lot. So by the time I got to the, the this House of Grief trial, I, I was, you know, I at least knew a few things about what was going on. So I stuck with it all the way through and it went for seven years. When I say it went, there would be one hearing per year and the rest of the year you'd just be twiddling your thumbs waiting to know what the next one was going to be. I wanted the reader to come with me into those times of uncertainty um, and, to, and to feel that, to feel how as you sit there and you watch one witness after another and the story swings, it's always swinging and, and there might be... Oh, and a piece of expert evidence that's laid down and you think oh my god if that's the truth then that must be a lie and th those moments of of uncertainty um, and sometimes quite a panicky feeling that you get in a court I, I couldn't see how I could convey that if I was writing in third person um, as if I knew already knew everything so I, I basically wanted the reader to come with me on, on the on the long trail through the story and, and for them to feel the constantly changing. I mean, every, you cannot wait to get to the court every morning because something is going to surprise you. It, it's, never, it's never just a lay down straight track. It, it's a curved track and it's up mountains and it's a, you've got to swim across a couple of rivers. And it's the most thrilling thing that, I've, that I know about watching a trial from start to finish. I loved the, the formality of it. I, I loved the way that everybody stands and that everyone bows. I don't know if it's the same here, but when the judge comes in, everyone stands up and the judge bows and everyone in the room bows. 
and I love that way that the tip staff says, all persons having business before this honourable court, make yourself known and you shall be heard. And that, that sort of thing gives me, fills me with a kind of um, a, a joyful feeling. You know, I feel like a citizen. I live in a country where you can be heard and there are ways that justice, people strive for justice, even if you don't get it, people are still striving for it. And I find that um, I think a lot of people get really cynical about the law and I don't want to be cynical. I mean, obviously some you can see the corruption that exists and you can see how unfair it is and how terrible it can be for women and how shockingly hopeless the law is at dealing with sexual crimes or domestic violence. Um, but there's some kind of earnest decency that you see in courts that I find really inspiring. <laughs> <laughs>